Well, good evening to you and welcome. Welcome to you and thank you for coming to this opening session of uh, this year of Sunday at the Abbey. Um, as you came in, I, I hope you picked up this little doojabi because on the back side it has the whole set of talks that are focused on mercy. Uh, this talk tonight is by Father Michael on, on the scriptural kind of basis for that, and, and clearly that's a, is, is a huge topic, so I mean, Father Michael is going to have to take a, an archaeological slice, if you will. Uh, on, on November 8th, uh, Father Columbus Stewart is going to be speaking about uh, mercy as it's expressed in the rule of Benedict and for our two monastic communities, but for anybody else who's interested in the rule itself, that, that, that expression is, is, I think, of interest. On December 6th, we're doing something, and now for something completely different, we're doing a, uh, an evening of song, not here, but in St. Benedict's Chapel to celebrate the um, uh, renewal of that instrument in, in the chapel. January 24th is Dan Ward, and he's going to be looking at the, the way in which Mercy is expressed, if you will, in the laws that guide the work of the church, huh? Let me tell you, we really worked on that title. <laughs> on the 21st of February, uh, Luke Mancuso is going to be looking at two or three films in which mercy, reconciliation are, is a kind of core element. And finally, uh, Dick on, on Zen, Zengi is doing presentation on uh, the way in which our country and our society deals with the actual expression of mercy in our judicial system, in our prison system, etc. So that's, that's, we're trying to take seriously uh, Pope Francis's invitation to, uh, to reflect on mercy this coming year. So it's truly my pleasure to introduce to you Father Michael Patella who's originally from Rochester, New York, came to St. John's via uh, uh, being a member of St. Mary's Abbey in Morristown, New Jersey, made solemn vows here at St. John's in 1989, ordained in 1990. Um, after some teaching experience, he obtained his doctorate in scripture from the École Biblique in 1995, published a number of books on the Gospel of Luke, and most recently uh, really brought to fruition all of the work that the Committee on Illumination and Text did for the St. John's Bible in a volume entitled Word and Image, the Hermeneutics of the St. John's Bible. He's now a full professor. He has directed the Jerusalem program and in the footsteps of Paul many times, more than we can count. Huh? He teaches graduate and undergraduate theology courses, mostly in scripture. He also serves importantly for us at this time, as rector of the seminary for us. So Pope Francis, as I've noted, has asked us to reflect on the meaning and expression of the mercy of God in, in our lives, in our experience, in the church, in the way in which we live together. And so this evening, Father Michael is speaking to us on the theme of mercy in the scriptures. And the title of his talk is, For His Mercy Endures Forever a very familiar refrain to those of us who pray one, Psalm 136 frequently. A scriptural read of divine justice, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Please give a warm Collegeville welcome to Father Michael Patella. Thank you very much, Abba John, and good evening, everyone. And thank you for all coming out. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, this, this discussion with uh, reading a portion of uh, The Merchant of Venice, Portia's Plea for Mercy, uh, and uh, I hope I get the, the iambic pentameter correct. I know a lot of English majors and professors, former professors sitting here. <laughs> the quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty. 
wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the heart of kings, is an attribute to God himself, and earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. And for those who prefer justice, Portia goes on, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. I have spoke thus much to mitigate the justice of thy plea, which, if thou follow the strict court of Venice, must needs give sentence against the merchant there. Portia, or rather William Shakespeare, did not come up with these beautiful lines by himself or herself. They are the product of the Christian tradition that has been directly influenced by sacred scripture and the liturgy. For our purposes this evening, we will concentrate on sacred scripture, which of course is always proclaimed during the liturgy. Forgiveness is constitutive of the Christian life and there's no way getting around it. Then Peter, quoting from Matthew's gospel, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. In order for someone to forgive another, there must first be mercy. Mercy leads to forgiveness, and forgiveness leads to reconciliation. What I would like to do here this evening is give the scriptural background to mercy, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Starting with the Old Testament. The English word mercy translates several Hebrew terms, which can broadly be set under two categories. The first category is what we can call for our purposes covenantal mercy, and the second juridical mercy. With some variation, these two categories continue through the New Testament literature, but with an important reinterpretation. So the covenant. Beginning with Abraham in Genesis 15 through 17, chapters 15 through 17, we see the Lord taking a special initiative in selecting a group of people from among the nations on earth to be his chosen people, his chosen ones. And the object of that initiative are Abraham's descendants through Sarah and their son Isaac. The covenant surfaces again in a very big way at Exodus 12 through 24 when the Lord God rescues the people from Pharaoh's yoke and saves them from the Red Sea's waters and gives Moses and the Israelites the law. The people ratify that law in Exodus 24, verse 3. When Moses came to the people and related all the words and ordinances of the Lord, they all answered with one voice, we will do everything the Lord has told us. This whole scene in Exodus thus becomes the primary reference point for the covenant, and its ramifications not only spread out from that point through the rest of the Old Testament, but they, are also, that they also go through living Judaism today. Nearly every definition in reference to mercy in Scripture, and in both the Old and New Testaments, references this covenantal relationship. And by the way, um, I should have given a little traffic directions in the beginning. In those handouts, I have all the scriptural quotations that I'm using. I won't be reading all of them. I'll be referring to them. But in case you want to follow along, that's where you can find them in the handout. Um, covenantal mercy. Because the covenant plays such an important role in divine revelation, the Hebrew vocabulary describing mercy relates specific nuances of the covenant. The first and probably best known is chesed, a term signifying mercy, compassion, and grace. It is often translated into English by the phrase steadfast love, enduring love, or steadfast mercy. The adjective steadfast is the operative word here. The ongoing nature of this kind of mercy continues over time and does not cease in the face of adversity. Important to remember is that the Lord God is always steadfast, even though at times the chosen people are anything but. The Lord demands that the people show him the same kind of love and compassion that he shows them, but more often than not, they fail miserably at it. Yet, 
the Lord does not relent in his chesed toward them. Another Hebrew word that is used in relation to the Lord God's love for his people is hain, or favor, grace. It usually describes a free act of God toward an individual or group that accents, motivates, or is motivated by some action. Mercy and compassion also translate hain, and why this is so is not difficult to see. In our own lives, we might do a favor or give, give a gift to someone for a variety of reasons. We may want to repay someone for a good deed shown to us. We might want the person to think well of us. We might try to influence a certain decision or climb a social ladder. ladder. We may even try to bribe a politician. Even our best intentions are mixed with ulterior motives, and there's no way around it. The Lord, however, bestows grace and favor without expecting anything in return except our love. And when we do not show the love, he still shows us grace and favor. And that is because the grace is always motivated by God's steadfast love or his chesed. Finally, there's the Hebrew word nacham, meaning compassion. We can talk about the Lord's chesed, the Lord's chesed that he shows us, and the chesed we are supposed to show him, but what kind of mercy do we show each other? Spouses may be able to show chesed toward each other and their children and vice versa. For us to do so for people beyond such close relationship can become most difficult. Nonetheless, we are to show it, and we show can show people genuine human compassion. And that kind of compassion is nacham. It's the kind of compassion that many missionaries, volunteers, agents of social justice, rescue workers, first responders, firefighters, and police officers, police often have that type of compassion that moves them to action. Now some examples of Hesed. From the Book of Wisdom we read, but you, our God, are good and true, slow to anger, and governing all with mercy. That phrase, slow to anger, is one of my favorites. Within the Old Testament text, people seem to do everything to anger God. And at times, they seem to go out of their way to do something to, in order to anger God. Yet God has more patience than we can imagine, and he continues to love them. That is his steadfast love. It is not a love shaken by our lack of response or debilitated by our wrongdoing. Even more to the point in, uh, is this passage from Exodus. The Lord came down in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name Lord. So the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in love and fidelity, continuing his love for a thousand generations and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet not declaring the guilty guiltless, but bringing punishment for their parents' wickedness on children and children's children to the third and fourth generation. What's most interesting about this passage um, in Exodus is the comparison between the Lord's mercy upon those faithful to the covenant, even to the point of forgiving their transgressions of wickedness and rebellion and sin for a thousand generations, and at the same time, not declaring the guilty guiltless. No, such wickedness brings punishment upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Now, a generation in biblical terms is about 20 years, or some people say it's 40 years, so you can, I'll go by 20 because the math is easier. And if we do the math, God's mercy extends to 20,000 years, where his wrath peters out at about 60 or 80 years. It's an interesting thought. What the writer is trying to say in this poetic flourish is obvious. God's mercy is endless, though even, though even if he takes time to chastise some, his mercy is still endless. Now, if we are looking for a particular Old Testament book in which God's mercy predominates, it would have to be the Psalms. In that collection, the word mercy appears over 124 times, which is an occurrence rate of 82%. Because the Psalms constitute the people's response to God in their history, 
a history that covers earthly creation, slavery, freedom, bondage, deliverance, near annihilation, exile, return, restoration. The preponderance of God's mercy or chesed not only covers the historical narrative, it defines it. And Psalm 136 provides a good example. I have it there in your handout, so just read a few pieces from there. Praise the God, starting out with creation, praise the God of gods for his mercy is forever, the Lord of lords for his mercy is forever, who alone has done great wonders for his mercy forever, and so on. And then we come into um, God working with his people in history. Let Israel out from their midst for his mercy endures forever, with mighty hand and outstretched arm for his mercy endures forever. And then going down, once they get settled, um, get settled in the country, um, uh, slew powerful kings for his mercy endures forever. Og, the king of Bashan, for his mercy endures forever. The Lord remembered us in our low estate for his mercy endures forever, etc., etc. For his mercy endures forever. It goes through every major event in Israelite history and just kept talking, praising God for his mercy endures forever, which shows that everyone is relying on God's mercy for their very being. The very fact that they're alive, and we can say the same thing, the very fact that we are alive is because of God's mercy. We're here because of God's mercy. <clears throat> Proverbs, Wisdom of Solomon and Sirach, within the book, Wisdom books, are similar in this regard. God's mercy prevails over every shortcoming among the people. Now the prophets. The prophets have the unenviable task of calling people on their sins and shortcomings and then informing them what their punishment will be. And no one does this job better than Jeremiah. For thus says the Lord, Indeed I will hand you over to terror, you and all your friends. Your own eyes shall see them fall by the sword of their enemies. All Judah I will hand over to the power of the king of Babylon, who shall take them captive to Babylon or strike them down with the sword. All the wealth of this city, all its resources, its valuables, all the treasures of the kings of Judah I will hand over to their enemies, who will plunder and, and carry it away to Babylon. Isaiah, on the other hand, condemns the people for all their transgressions and calls forth the appropriate punishment. Simultaneously, he speaks about the Lord's mercy once that punishment arrives. So he, he, he softens it a bit. This iniquity of yours shall be like a descending rift, bulging out in a high wall whose crash comes suddenly and an instant, crashing like a potter's jar smashed beyond rescue. And among its fragments cannot be found assured to scoop fire from the hearth or to dip water from the cistern. For, this, for thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, By waiting and by calm you shall be saved, in quiet and in trust shall be your strength. But this you did not will. A thousand shall tremble at the threat of one. If five threaten, you shall flee. You will then be left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a flag on a hill. He kind of he, he calls the people more to their task and, and tries to show them what, 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 what skin they have in this game. That uh, they, they could still, perhaps, um, rely on the mercy of God. Things are going to be pretty bad, but hold fast and you will see God's mercy come. Of course, they don't. Israel, Isaiah finishes this great description of people's, people's moral shortcomings along with the ensuing consequences, consequences and then states in the very next verse, Truly the Lord is waiting to be gracious to you. Truly he shall rise to show you mercy. For the Lord is a God of justice. Happy are all who wait for him. Yes, people of Zion, dwelling in Jerusalem, you shall no longer weep. He will be gracious to you when you cry out. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. Yet, fortunately, Jeremiah can even get squeezed in a little bit of a merciful word when we push him. The anger of the Lord will not abate until he has carried out completely the decisions of his heart. In days to come, you will fully understand it. At that time, oracle of the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who escaped the sword find favor in the wilderness. As Israel comes forward to receive rest, from afar the Lord appears. With age old love I have loved you, so I have kept my mercy toward you. 
Now let's move to the New Testament. There is a common but mistaken notion that the Old Testament is about justice and the New Testament is about mercy. And from what I've just reviewed, it should be evident that such an idea is not really true to fact. There's plenty of divine mercy in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we see how God's mercy toward his people is translated into a means by which God's people can show mercy to each other. So far, we've been dealing very much with this people, divine, God, God to people, people, God. That relationship, a very vertical relationship. And the mercy is eternal coming from this vertical relationship. What the New Testament is going to do is it's going to be able to show and make it possible for that divine mercy that exists between God and his people to start to be extended out to other people in God's, God's broader creation. In each of the four Gospels, it is possible to show God's mercy toward his people and the divine commandment on how God's people are to show mercy to each other. For our purposes, I would like to start with Luke, then go to Matthew, John, and Paul. Now, you'll notice that I am not including Mark. It is not that Mark does not have any passages of mercy in it. He has. He has lots of passages of mercy. But it's because the other Gospels contain as much of the same material, and they say it better. I mean, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and you can't do it all. So, so all four Gospels show mercy. I'm concentrating on the, on, the, on the passages that are perhaps best known. For one thing, Luke's Gospel, starting with Luke then, for one thing, Luke's Gospel, through its, many, through its infancy narratives, builds a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is why I'm starting with Luke, because it, it does make that bridge between the two Testaments much, much more fluid. Secondly, Luke, in the words of Dante, is the scribe of the meekness of Christ. Um, Dante, and people have noticed this throughout, throughout the centuries, that um, when you're reading Luke's gospel, he has a real sense of mercy and Christ's meekness and Christ's compassion, much more, um, or at least better written and much, much more prominent than in other gospels. It's a lot of mercy you're looking for. He's the go-to gospel, Luke, in other words. In the first chapter of Luke, we have both the Magnificat, or Mary's Canticle, and the Benedictus, or Zechariah's Canticle. The critical lines in the Magnificat are these. His mercy is from age to age to those who fear him. He has shown might with his arm, dispersed the arrogant of mind and heart. He has thrown down the rulers from their thrones, but lifted up the lowly. The hungry he has filled with good things, the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped Israel, his servant, remembering his mercy. Similar lines in the Benedictus. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our fathers and to be mindful of his holy covenant. Picking right up from everything we just talked about in the Old Testament. The, <clears throat> in both selections, the Old Testament theme or chesed or God's enduring love, continues and foreshadows its completion. In both, um, in the point is that the God the Father's great act of mercy, or of chesed, is sending his Son into the world to be incarnated here. If God can show such mercy toward us, we can certainly show such mercy toward others. So the incarnation is the great sacrament of mercy. God taking such pity and compassion and mercy on his people that he sends his only son. Now, extending that mercy to others, we have Luke's parable of the Good Samaritan, which is an excellent example. The Jews and the Samaritans were the bitterest of bitter enemies for a lot of historical reasons. And the interesting thing about the parable is that the Samaritan is traveling in Jewish territory. So he's on friendly ground as it is. It's very risky for him to do that. And yet he comes to the help of save a Jew in a Jewish territory. And the Jew is going to receive the help that the Samaritan offers, which also is going to be a very, adds a lot of depth to the, um, to the parable. Throughout our discussion so far, God's mercy has been constant toward God's people. And indeed in the Old Testament, with their understanding of the law, the people were to show mercy toward other members of the covenant but with the parable of the Good Samaritan, God's chosen people are to extend mercy beyond themselves 
even to their enemies. Luke underscores this point at the crucifixion, where we hear Jesus hanging on the cross say, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And so that mercy, that, that mercy that goes beyond even our comprehension, where the crucifixions were known for the, the crucified people to be on the cross to sit and curse everyone who came by them and in and, and, and all their agony, Christ um, is able to say, forgive them. That one scene in Luke underscores everything Christ has proclaimed, suffered and died for. Forgiveness. Christ's merciful act is one act is one of forgiveness. Christ's most merciful act is one of forgiveness. And the proof of that forgiveness and mercy is the resurrection. Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's gospel can almost be considered the constitution for the kingdom of God. And within this sermon, the Beatitudes occupy pride of place. In his introduction on mercy, Jesus simply says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Which fits right in with the interpretive verse, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of pro or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Which um, in, Mark's, in Matthew, Jesus says several verses down. In Matthew's theology, the whole Old Testament is fulfilled or brought to perfection in the New Testament. And, does, and it does so with the phrase, and also found in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said to your ancestors, but I say to you. This is constantly going in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount begins at chapter 5 and goes to the end of chapter 7. And once we get beyond the Beatitudes, there are all these examples that Jesus will use from forgiveness of sin, enemies, um, adultery, murder, um, envy, jealousy, all the things that he goes through there. And he will always preface it by saying, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. So taking that whole Old Testament understanding of chesed and chen and nacham and moving them and, and, and saying, we've got to start moving this out a bit more and pushing out the borders a bit. For this reason, and, and one, one that really, uh, Matthew also has a memorable par parable too about the necessity of mercy, um, which I like about Matthew because he can get very earthy in this one, and says that it really gets to the heart of the matter. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell at the knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But the same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not you have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, the Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Kind of self-interest in there, that parable. Um, not only, you know, it, it, there's the beautiful theory about forgiving others as, as God has forgiven us, as through his son has forgiven us, we are to take that mercy shown us and spread it out because our own salvation depends on it. If we can't show mercy, says the parable, then no mercy will be shown us either. It would be unrecognizable to us and also it's, it's you reap what you sow. We have to, this is taking the gospel seriously. And John, something similar. In the beloved story from John's gospel, the woman caught in adultery, at the very end when the elders drop their stones one by one and file away, Jesus asks this question, woman, where are they? 
Has no one condemned you? John continues. She replied, no one, sir. Then Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, now on do not sin anymore. Of course, there's that very interesting phrase, to condemn. Okay, there's a recognition that wrong, there was wrongdoing that took place somehow, somewhere along the line, in the woman's past somewhere. And yet, the condemnation is released. The mercy is there, the forgiveness is there. He's also saying those words to us. God has not condemned us, thereby giving us the freedom and the obligation not to condemn others. And indeed, to show mercy toward others is to live in the mercy shown to us. Then the third point, reconciliation. No explanation of God's mercy, forgiveness, and reconciliation could be complete without reference to St. Paul. Just as both, both Luke and Matthew, as well as Mark and John in their own way, show how the mercy extends to his people, Paul demonstrates how God's mercy fits into the divine plan of salvation. Paul can only make this claim because of, absolute, of his absolute reliance on the cross. To him, great mercy was shown, this great persecutor of the Christians. For Christians, there is no other proof or lesson or example or proposition or story that proclaim, can proclaim and make known God's mercy and our participation in that mercy than the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. Nothing else does it. That is the ever-flowing font of mercy. Moreover, just as Christ, just Christ, has, just as Christ has shown it and effected it for us, so too must we show it to others. And we can withhold that forgiveness and mercy, but if we do so, we do so at our own peril. In Colossians, he is head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. So, in summary, in the Old Testament, the covenantal mercy between the Lord and the Lord's people is the dominant metaphor. And it is shown by the use of the Hebrew terms chesed and hain. Chesed being steadfast love, hain, mercy and grace, and also nacham, meaning compassion toward one's fellow, fellow beings, human beings. In the New Testament, these three, those three characteristics come together in Christ's incarnation, itself a great act of mercy. Mercy can only lead to forgiveness. With Christ's great act of forgiveness on the cross, we have reconciliation with God and thus eternal life. The church makes this point perfectly clear by the prayer of absolution in the sacrament of reconciliation. It's a prayer that solidly sits within the whole of New Testament scripture. And I have the verse numbers after each phrase. God, the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. Through the ministry of the church, may God grant you pardon and peace, and I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. To return to the words of Portia, mercy blesseth him that gives and him that takes. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Extending mercy, forgiveness, and reconciliation is a blessing upon those uh, to whom it is shown as well as those to whom bestow it. And that is the one of the great, one of the great pieces of, of the kind of the great Christian paradoxes, that this is one example of something we give that we, that's returned upon us fourfold, hundredfold. It's part of the hundredfold. Because showing mercy earns us a special blessing. The blessing of God, who himself died on the cross, showing mercy. So um, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, any questions or comments? Any any comments or anything like that? Or questions or clarifications? JP. Uh, what about Rakami? Rakami? Yeah. The love, the mercy that the mother showed to the child. child. 
Okay. Okay. Um, and where does that fit into all this? Or yeah. Okay. If the the, the Rakamim, that is um, the 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 mercy a mother shows to a child. Okay. Of course, that's a metaphor that's likened to God. Okay. So God is the mother showing mercy to the child. It's an example of you know can a mother forget her child? I think is one of the phrases that comes comes in with that. Is um, a metaphor that's showing the strength of God's mercy and the love and the kindness that comes with that. Because it's also a tenderness there. It's, it's, it's not juridical. I mean, it becomes really, it becomes very, very anthropological and very full. And I, I didn't follow that one through, but I like it. Father Michael, I have a question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. Um, and so can you speak just a little bit to um, these um, images of mercy that you described leading us into a year of mercy with the church, how might that look? What might we strive for um, from different levels of the church? Yeah, Locally, sure. uh, yeah. all the way up to the upper hierarchy? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, mercy is a big term. I think that the best thing to say is, um, if I can read into the Pope, I mean, you know, extending a year of mercy um, if you follow everything that the Pope has been saying, you know, since you know he, he was elected, okay, he's, he's kind of constantly pushing back against a very absolutist and very much um, a doctrinaire approach to faith. He doesn't want to dismiss doctrine or dogma or anything like that, but it's not the leading foot. And the leading foot is mercy and compassion, and that itself is the doctrine. Okay, that itself is the doctrine because we have everything else because of God's compassion on us. And it kind of comes back to what I was saying over here, you know, um, mercy benefits the ones to whom it is shown, but it also benefits the one who bestows it. And I think in terms of in an individual basis, I mean, you can think of tons of examples that way, but I think as an institutional basis for the church, um, you know, I, I think it's great, you know, in a society that's so litigious as ours, and uh, you know, everyone's suing everyone about everything, that um, having an institution that's leading off in mercy is great witness value. Now, the, the point is we've got to start practicing that as well in many of the ways we do. And some people are better at it than others. Are you doing cultural? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Why not? <laughs> uh, Michael, yeah. um, I'd like to just, just step back and draw on perhaps uh, yeah your own awareness of, of how this biblical tradition relates to the tradition of the gods in other cultures. Oh, yeah, is, okay. Is there, so, for example, the, the Greek gods and the Roman gods, or, or in other religious traditions, it, it strikes me that, that when you look at the biblical witness, how, and, and it's not univalent, it's, as you pointed out, it's, it's there, there's a lot of stuff going on in the Old Testament and, and the Hebrew scriptures and the yeah. Jewish scriptures. But there's still, nevertheless, I, it seems to me, is something that's a real breakthrough oh, yeah. in the biblical witness. Oh, and I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, that, 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 I like doing that. That's kind of fun, actually. Um, because when you look at some, compare some, you know, some of the others, you want to have like the idea, and I'm, and I'm part, pointing here in really broad strokes, really broad strokes. Um, let me say, like with the, with the Greek and the Roman gods, there's certainly definitely an aloofness there. Um, you know, they have, they have their own, the gods have their own playground, and they do what they want. And sometimes, you know, for extra fun or something like that, they might come down, like, um, like maybe Athena, and disguise herself as, as someone and kind of help someone out in, a, in, a, in an instant or something like that. But really, there's, they have very little skin in the game, is the phrase I like to use. No skin in them. You know, it, it just exists in two separate universes. The people themselves are constantly, um, and again, it's varying from culture to culture, from what I've seen, and, um, that in their fear and trepidation of the gods. Generally, um, anthropologists will say, if you kind of look at history, the Egyptian gods were um, many, 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 but they were a little bit more, a little bit more mild than, and a little bit more friendly than, say, the Babylonian gods. And part of that has to do with kind of the two countries because the Nile was so predictable and, you, and everything was always fine. It was surrounded by deserts. So they didn't have to worry about conquering armies as much. And so everything went really, really well. 
But when you get to Babylon, where they have um, the Tigris and the Euphrates and the Mesopotamia coming down from the mountains and thunderstorms could trick, um, this, um, could cause a flood and everything else, the gods are seen as much more irate and vicious. Um, but in any case, I think the best thing we can say is that the gods really didn't care about human beings at all, unless it meant you know, something to have fun with. You know, like pouring you know, hot water in an anthill or something like that. That's, that's, the, that's the image I like to use in class a lot, actually. Um, yes, please. Yeah. Back to the dog. Did everyone hear what I said so far? Did, should I give the scraps to the dogs? And right. she says even the dogs get to eat at the mas under the master's table. Yeah. Does that show us that she was challenging enough to Jesus to widen his um, his understanding that what he came for was not just the Jews but for more? Yeah. Well, is there another way to see that? Well, there's a, there are a lot of ways to see it. I mean, this, that's one of the that's one of the big. Um, um, I mean, for a lot of biblical exegetes, that's a big stumbling block because, and if you read a lot of the commentaries, you know, because Jesus gets kind of snippy there, you know, <laughs> and, you know, trying to find different ways, you know, he said this in order to test her, you know, he didn't really even mean it, he was just kind of saying it, or, you know, um, or the church put this in to show, to do just that, that this was a story the church put in to show how, why the church can now go out to be beyond the, the tribe of Israel, beyond the, beyond the Israelites. Um, yeah, no, that's right. I'm getting to that one. Okay, um, and or did Jesus grow in his understanding? Okay, um, okay. Now um, there are other examples in the Gospels where it seems that Jesus is challenged. There's there's this there's this kind of give and take with Jesus in other areas in other particular areas too. The woman at the well would be another good example, um, and it's and, and and also when he himself is. Um, uh, well, it depends on the gospel. Now, Luke's gospel, you have Jesus. It's, it doesn't go through Samaritan territory, but he walks along the border of the Samaritan territory, and he met Samar meets Samaritan lepers. So there's this little thing that some of, the, some of the gospels give it full throttle, others not so much. So exactly what each gospel writer was saying about Jesus is the call we're trying to make. So is Mark trying to show Jesus growing in his understanding? Yes, perhaps. Or was Jesus trying to show others that this is the way we should go by also being respectful to where he's coming from? You know how I mean by that? You know, like, um, let me give a good example. Uh, he wants to keep... He wants to keep his, his um, credibility with the people who are following him. They can't go any further. So rather than, it's kind of like, rather than going headlong in, into, like Samaria, into the Syrian territory, going in there headlong and saying, look what I'm doing. You people probably think this is scandalous, but I'm the son of God, and I'm going to go here, okay? You know, and I don't want to hear anything about it. Instead of kind of you know, getting people all not, you know, nervous that way, he pauses and gives them time to catch up to where he wants to go by asking these kind of provocative questions and then moving into the, into the new territory. And every gospel writer does it differently. Okay, each one does it differently. Or has, has the same little element of the, they call it the universalism, same little element of the universalism and each one's handling it a little bit differently. Okay? Jesse. Uh, so your community praise these scripture passages a lot, like in Liturgy of the Hours, especially with the Magnificat and Benedictus and obviously the Psalms. Mm -hmm. um, so how does praying these scriptures that have to do with mercy, how does that impact your community life? Oh, and are you speaking in me individually or are you speaking for everyone? We have, we <laughs> speak with, we're like so merciful. <laughs> No, I think, no, I, it, I think that, let me say, part of the whole Benedictine tradition, part of the whole, the, the whole monastic tradition, is that the idea of scripture becomes like food. And, and in fact, this becomes one of the metaphors, that you digest it and it becomes part of you, just as much as you, know, you become what you eat. 
kind of that whole idea. And the whole thing with the scripture, saying it every day and concentrating on these passages should have an effect on you. Personally, I think it does. Okay. Um, um, yeah, I think it does. I think it does. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's always easy. I mean, if you, you, you find, and I'm sure you, you know, you've been here long enough, so you've probably been doing enough of the same thing, that something comes up in everyday life and it gets you in a, in a little you know, frizzle or something like that. You can think of some scriptural passage that kind of has an answer for it, and you hope it's the one you know, um, that is not a curse. <laughs> you know, so I think it does. I mean, it does, you know, the mercy of God. Yeah. And that's why we pray, really. Father Michael. Oh, yeah. I have a question. Um, so this may be redundant in asking you to repeat something that you said, but I feel like I missed something because the transition happened so quickly. Um, so we were talking about mercy, and then the word reconciliation came up. And I guess I kind of miss the difference because reconciliation seems so particular to the new Yeah, 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 yeah good. I and should, so yeah. I kind of got lost there. Okay, yeah, okay. And then, and then I think that is like, where's the reconciliation here? And the reconciliation comes with the cross. I'll say that categorically, but let me pack, unpack that a bit. Um, what you have is this. And you, we're aiming toward reconciliation because that's the ultimate, God's ultimate act, right? Reconciliation, reconcil reconciling the human race with God. Okay, for our salvation. That's, that's where we're aiming for all this. It all comes, and we're supposed to participate in that. And we participate in it. First, there has to be mercy. You, you know, the, the mercy is, is the idea that, that um, somehow the person I'm looking at, no matter how I feel, no matter how I feel, the person I'm looking at deserves a better shake, the benefit of the doubt, or something like that, or at least some ounce of compassion or something. It has to be the mercy. If the per mercy, if you can, sh you have to get to the point where you can show mercy, and mercy not, you know, um, I'm thinking like, well, let's even think of some of the great things that happened in history, you know, the great genocides and things like that. Um, um, I'll give you an example. We might give you an example of that, okay? But show mercy. The mercy leads to forgiveness. I can say, all right, I'm not going to go after you with vengeance. I'm not going to go chase you down to the ends of the earth. I'm just going to leave you be. You go your way. I don't want anything to do with you, but just you know, God bless you and go away, okay? It's, an act of, it's really an act of forgiveness. Reconciliation, now if you get that far, reconciliation is coming back to that moment and saying, I can live with you, okay? And I, and I want what's best for you, even if it, I want what's best for you, even if it's gonna entail my extra effort to make what's best for you happen. It's like a reconciliation. Okay, much more of coming right to, to terms where you can face each other and even have a conversation. Okay? The example I want to give is this, and this actually is very apropos. Um, years ago, I was traveling in Syria, and um, there, there are usually markers from the, from the great Armenian genocide that um, under, well, 100 years ago now, at the end of World War I. And of course, a lot of the Armenians um, went from Turkey into Syria and tried to make their way down to Palestine, because that was under British control at the time, and thought, uh, well, it was, it was uh, you know, it was still under, uh, it was, it was uh, the Holy Land, okay, and eventually it became British control, which brought more in, because they felt they could, they have a safer home there. But to do that, they had to cross to Syria, and there was, there was a monument there, a kind of, a, not very big, maybe about the size of this, this podium right here, that had, a, had um, something scribed in Armenian, but underneath was also in English, which I thought for itself was kind of fascinating for that part of the world at that time. But it said, um, I can never forgive you what I, for what you have done, speaking to the Turks, I can never forgive you for what you have done. May my grandchildren forgive your grandfathers. That sounds really, really bizarre, right? I mean, where are the grandfathers in this and all that stuff? But that if you, you know, get through all the great grammar and kind of put your way through it, the person is saying, this is too raw for me, but I hope that this is not something that's going to endure forever because I don't want that either. And that's what that phrase is saying. And by that very fact of coming to that acknowledgement, that's an act of mercy and forgiveness. And that is perfectly in line with the cross. Okay?
Michael, thank you. I appreciate your presentation. Uh, it struck me that there, there really seems to be a balance between justice and mercy as you presented it from the biblical perspective. And I'm wondering if you have given any thought to how that is so not the case in our society today, uh, where there seem to be so many very major kind of issues that are uh, where uh, we tend to base our position on some concept of justice. I think of the uh, undocumented immigrants, for example, uh, as well as the issue of capital punishment. Uh, have you, I know Dick and Zenge is gonna be speaking more on the civic side mm -hmm. of this uh, in a couple of months, but I'm just wondering, have you given any uh, kind of thought to connecting what you've spoken about tonight to that reality? Well, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I do. I mean, I, that's <laughs> all the time, actually. Uh, <laughs> I haven't supposed to, but I think what I would say is, um, uh, well, what what we see in our country, you know, it, it, when, especially in some of the people who like to see this as a Christian sense of justice, which is really revenge, um, and or those who keep saying eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, is like that's going to make up for everything. That's the only way we have to go, completely forgetting everything else. Um, really, I'm missing the point. Okay, that if we're going to call, if we want to call ours, and we're not, and I know the whole nation is not Christian, but there are enough Christians around. If you're going to call yourselves a Christian, a call, if we're going to call ourselves a Christian, then we better, then we are obligated, I would say, to go by what the scripture account, uh, the scriptural account, in, and you know, the, the traditional account, the biblical tradition, and that account of what uh, mercy and forgiveness all are, and even in our public policy. Um, that I mean, I think that's that's a, that that if we're talking about the if we're talking about that vertical come becoming horizontal and reaching out, it's reached out in in real life in a real time in a real situation and not just in you know in theory. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much, Father Michael. Yeah. Uh, it perhaps my aging ears, but but I I had a hard time hearing in this discussion, something might we call unconditional mercy. The stories, especially the Matthew uh, story about the unjust servant, is, it wasn't mercy. It was mercy to the point that you don't go out and are unmerciful. And maybe I'm this uh, naive uh, child of the 60s. Actually, I was a child of the 30s, but <laughs> uh, uh, that unconditional means even if you go out, after I've given you mercy and you go out and you violate it, I still am the source of mercy. God is the source of mercy. And in the Old Testament, it's certainly hard to find unconditional mercy. I wonder if you'd reflect on this. Yeah, I, th I mean, and, and I, would, I wouldn't, I, my question, my answer to that, um, Joe, would be this. Um, going back to that very same parable, okay, I mean, it makes it sound like it's conditional. In order for you to get mercy, you have to show mercy. You want to obtain mercy, you have to show mercy. Yeah, okay. Um, but now let's move it to, if you want to say unconditional. I'm going to push back and say, if you can't show mercy, will you recognize the mercy that's shown to you? That's the question, I think. Will you recognize the mercy that's shown to you? Um, and this is what I think the whole idea of, of um, our actions and all the stuff, you know, all the, all the warnings we get in so many of these gospel passages saying, you know, beware the moment, beware the hour and all that. Um, even even the, some of the ones about the riches, especially in Luke's gospel, about, you know, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. And okay. um, when you go through all that, we tend to sometimes take the position, well, Okay, I thought God was Saul loving, and he's not going to allow this, you know, me to go in or whatever it's going to be because I've done X, Y, or Z. I think the point of all that, the point in, in all those stories is that um, if, in every one of those cases, every one of those cases, the negative cases, everyone is depending on everything except mercy, everyone's, or except God. Everyone's depending on his, his or her own gifts, his or her own intelligence, his, you know, anything, anything. And we're doing it all, very Pelagian, okay? It's all depending on my, my own stuff. And if that is going to be my sole focus, when a moment comes when I need mercy and God's extending the hand of mercy, if I never saw it, observed it, or even calculated it to be as much in, the, in this life, 
what makes me so sure I'm going to see it and be able to grab it in the next life? And I think that's the focus of the parables. By showing mercy to others, we sensitize ourselves being shown mercy as well. It's not that God's for holding it back. It's not. He's always holding it out. Will we be there to grab it or take it? That's where I think the point is. I'm wondering, on the mercy and the forgiveness and the reconciliation, if I show mercy and forgive somebody and they've not asked for forgiveness, um, and then it, it seems like the first two uh, can be just an individual, but then the reconciliation takes two people. And right. if the reconciliation is never asked for or even attempted, how do I get to that point, or can all three just be in my own mind? What? Or how does that happen when the other person never even asks for forgiveness, asks for mercy, or isn't even interested in reconciliation? Yeah, that's a good. I think the point. Yeah, that's that's very good. I mean, you know, I mean, this is, you know, like I forgive you. I don't want your forgiveness. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it, you do have a lot of that in certain cases, right? And I think um, on ourselves is that we can't be responsible for the other person, but we can say, this is the disposition I want to live my life, no matter what the other person does. And if the person changes his or her mind, then I'm ready. But this is, this is as far as I can go. I mean, you hear these stories all the time, uh, very similar, you know, pastoral situations and stuff, that people are already, in, and no one's else there. Well, at least I'm going on with my own life knowing I've done everything humanly possible, and it's still there, it's still open. I'm not harboring the bitterness, I'm not building on the bitterness, I'm not making my heart go cold and angry and hard, and I'm getting on with life. That's sometimes the best we can do. And then if the person comes ringing the doorbell some years hence, well then, okay, we're ready to go. Because it helps us as well, right? I mean, there's, um, cause the thing with, with, that goes with mercy and forgiveness is um, not, you know, we may think we're harming the other person when we're not forgiving or showing mercy to. We may be thinking that. But actually, it's corroding us too. And that's, the kind of, that's, that's one of the things we always have to be aware of. When we start thinking all those hateful thoughts and everything else and start giving them root, it's, it's bad business. I, yeah, I have a question about the uh, the Matthew parable. Yeah. Just wondering about the um, the uh, collective sensibility in that parable, and the fact that um, the the unjust steward isn't discovered until the people say, "Oh, well, this is what's happened," and then they go and report it. So I'm just wondering about how I guess our own collective sense plays into this whole idea of mercy, like when you have the Truth and Reconciliation yeah. Commissions and those sorts of things, yeah. and, and how that plays in that parable, and how that's a necessary component of mercy. Yeah, I, and, and it's a necessary component. It, it, that's very interesting, too, because they're the ones who let all this know, right? They go back, and, and, and even while I was reading here tonight, the big question that's running through my mind is, why would they be going running back? Um, could, you know, you might say, well, maybe they're afraid of this unjust steward, too. Maybe he might come at them at something and maybe not forgive them. Oh, you can allow for that. But seemingly, he's not their boss, though. So why do they go running back? And it seems to me, and, and this is Matthew's, you know, Matthew being, a, a, um, when he talks a lot about, it emphasizes a lot about the church as a community relating to each other, okay? I think he might be, that might be part of the thing, you know. We all have a responsibility to... Um, toward those for whom, you know, who are suffering an injustice because of a lack of mercy and forgiveness. That, uh, that we, have, we have responsibility for making sure that somehow, some way, they, that's rectified. It's reported and right. something happens. You just can't, you just can't turn the other eye, mm -hmm. you know? Um, in fact, um, I just, it, it reminded me, just, I, saw, I was talking to a couple of people at supper tonight, that last night I saw the movie Black Mass, the story about Whitey Bulger and everything else. <laughs> I mean, it's very ironic. His whole thing in the, in the whole movie is that I didn't snitch. I didn't snitch. You know, he, didn't, he, didn't report, he was supposed to be an informant for the FBI, but he never snitched. He killed men, women, and children, and you know, ran them over with cars, machine guns, the whole thing, but he never snitched. He admits it. I killed lots of people, but I never snitched. Okay? Um, and 
well, you know where this is going. He hated anyone who snitched, and <laughs> those are all the people he killed. So um, it's, I think that's, that's, that's where you see it, because if you're not, gonna, if you're not standing up as a, I mean, better, easier said than done, but the fact is that points to the fact that the whole community is responsible for bringing this man to justice. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I'm going to ask a quick question, Michael, and that is, is a hinge in all of this is, is the actual reception of God's mercy as individuals yeah, I think. and communities. And, and some, I'm sure you've encountered human beings um, who, who have one heck of a hard time really trusting God's mercy. And I'm just wondering, as a last question here, yeah. if you could just comment on that. Okay, so comment on the people who have a hard time accepting God's mercy? Yeah, yeah, but on a pastoral level. Oh, yeah, yeah. What's the response? Yeah. What's, I mean, you know, because none of us, at least this child of God, <laughs> has not driven up to that 60 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, right. I know, it's, um, <laughs> I mean, you're a psychologist, and like I said, it's your upbringing, you know, the family of origin, and, you know, and all, you know, go on and on and on. But I sometimes think there's more than that there, too, as well. I mean, I think there's um, uh, a sense that we might, we might see it as so inconceivable that um, of our, our doing any forgiveness along these lines, therefore, it's also impossible for God. That's one thought I have on the matter. I don't know if how to how much water that holds. But it, it is, I always find it curious that if you say that God's mercy is extended, the people have, many people have tremendous doubts about that. I sometimes wonder if an antidote to that is on a human plane, the church, whatever, showing them mercy to, you know, extending out some mercy to them. And maybe, and that's exactly what Portia gets in her plea for mercy, you know? And maybe that's, maybe that's the way to, to, to smash that shell. Michael, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause. Um, on November 8th, uh, Father Columbus Stewart will follow this up with a presentation on uh, mercy and the rule of Benedict, the way we live our lives as Benedictines. So uh, thank you all for being here. It's been wonderful having you here. There is lots of wonderful uh, cookies back there prepared by Father Dunstan and refreshments. So please, and thank you.